We have an uh, electronic newsletter that's published three times a year. We hold two face-to-face -face meetings, one in the spring and then an annual meeting in the fall. And we try to associate these locations with some place that was on the railroad itself. But it's getting harder and harder to find any place to go that actually has something left of the railroad. Um, Leo, uh, our presenter today, is, is one of our popular authors in our organization. Um, we have another gentleman who's out of Auckland, New Zealand, who has never been in this country other than to visit a couple of times. And he is another one of our very active writers and researchers and, and presents material. Leo um, comes from a family of railroaders who were CB&Q employees. He was an unpaid intern at the Ola Roundhouse from 68 to 72 and served as a brakeman, switchman, and conductor from 1973 to 79. 79 to 80, assistant to the manager of trains and terminals in the Chicago Regional Headquarters. 1985 to 2006, he was the director of fleet services for Union Tank Car. And from 2006 until the present, he is the manager of rail car purchases, scrap and reconditioning and resale for AMG Resources. He has been a member of the Society since 1982 and currently serves on our Board of Directors and is also the Vice President of Education and Outreach. He's authored numerous articles for our Society as well as the Chicago Northwestern Historical Society. He's been our keynote speaker at numerous events. He holds two associate's degrees from Mobanzi Community College in Business and History and a bachelor's degree in Finance. So, Leo, welcome. The one thing Tom didn't mention is we brought a select section of our publications. We tried to pick out our publications that deal with the greater area around here. Our publications come out three times a year and depending on the author they, they may focus on anywhere on the system. Uh, I write a lot about this area so there's a number of publications here from the, some of the things that are in there are actually about Earl though. Uh, before I get into the actual presentation just so you understand by the way, I've been doing these since 2014, and we do them to make the, our society known to other historical societies, and in the hope that we'll have a cross-pollination of membership. But so you have some idea that we don't keep all of this on a website somewhere, and you just go in and start clicking and copying. This is one volume of the corporate history of the Burlington. There's 1,975 pages in here. I use this for some of the material. There's a lot of hard paper research. This is a timetable that the employees had to carry and have on their possession at all times when operating the train. They came out two to four times a year. And what I am so thankful for is that so many of my predecessor co-workers did not follow the instructions and say, destroy all previous timetables. These things are a gold mine of information, especially when you get way to the back and you start getting into the very fine print. There's, I found things about Earlville that I didn't know going through a number of these for this presentation. The other thing that's really helpful are these old passenger timetables. The railroad put these out twice a year when the clocks changed. And again, going way in the back to the local trains, I found information on trains that ran into and out of the Pearlville. On the branches, not on the main line. So, here we go. 
we're going to talk, we're not going to take a train trip. I often say we're going to take a train ride when I do a presentation. Today we're going to stay more or less in Earlville. The lawyers make me say this. I'll give you just a second. Basically, it's our legal disclaimer as to the source of our information. Short and sweet, we try to get permission to use whatever we put in our publications or our presentations. If we don't have it, you see something that you think you, you are the rightful owner of the copyright, point it out to us, we'll talk about it, we'll take it down if you don't want it used. Here's a quick outline. We're going to do a quick overview of the Burlington system. We're going to look at the peak of the Burlington and Northern Illinois, which was the Aurora Division. Then we'll, we'll drill that. We'll keep drilling down. We'll get into the lines near and into Earlville. Then we're going to look specifically at the Burlington and Earlville. Uh, we'll talk about from day one, when the first rail was laid here. We'll look at passenger and freight trains that not only went through town, but served town, stopped here. Uh, when I worked on the railroad, my favorite class of service was the freight locals. And we're going to spend some time talking about the freight locals that served Earlville, which I can tell you about firsthand. And then some personal recollections of Earlville, and then we'll have a quick question period at the end. So here's the Burlington system at its very peak, which would have been in the teens, very early 20s. There we go. And we start at Chicago. We go to St. Paul. We go west to Denver, north into Wyoming and Montana. We make a loop back. There's a line down southern Illinois. This was in the coal fields primarily, St. Louis. Um, and then there's a line down to Houston and the Gulf, out of Denver. It was a pretty wide system. Uh, management did have dreams of going from here out to the Pacific Coast. Um, we just had a conversation about that on our chat group the other day. But basically, um, they saw the horrendous costs to go through the mountains and decided not to. The system began at Aurora. Illinois as the Aurora Branch Railroad in 1849. It was organized in the city of Aurora. Um, some of the organizers came from Batavia. They, they started their meeting in Batavia, found out they needed more bodies, uh, more help. They literally got in their carriages and went to Aurora and held the meeting in Aurora. Uh, it was renamed to CB&Q, Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy in 1855 as they extended the lines. The company was always conservatively managed and financially strong. It was uh, a progressive organization, often first with innovations. Uh, some of the first air brake tests, uh, the Zephyrs, first stainless trains. The company paid dividends in the 1930s while many other railroads went bankrupt. They weren't big dividends, but they, they were financially able to stay afloat. Uh, this is something, articles have been written about this. Many, many managers, vice presidents from the Burlington ended up on other railroads as VPs and presidents. It was almost like a training ground. In March 3rd of 1970, the Q, which is the nickname for the Burlington, when I grew up as a kid, you'd ask someone where they worked, they'd say, I work for the Q. And that's just the way it was. Uh, the Q, the NP, the GN, and the SP and S formed the Burlington Northern. And I happened to be standing at the old roundhouse on that day and watched one of the first mixed contests of those different ra uh, railroads, locomotives go by. And the gentleman that I was working with at the roundhouse looked over and he said, well, it didn't take them long to mess that up. <laughs> In 81, uh, the BN and what was Officially, the SLSF, which is the, was the Frisco, merged. That, that stayed the BN. And in 1995, the BN and the Santa Fe merged and became BNSF. And that's where we're at today as far as the corporate structure. This map came out of a 1926 annual report. I am always amazed what I stumble on when I go digging through papers. 
This is Chicago here, and this is the line up north to Savannah, then up to the Twin Cities. This is the main line to Galesburg and Denver. And let's see, right about there is Earlville. Um, and we'll talk about these different lines. This is the Fox River branch down to Streeter and then back up to LaSalle and back to Zering. Then it goes up to Denrock and ends up back in Savannah. But you'll see here from these lines, uh, Earlville was of some importance for freight traffic and even for passenger. This line goes down to Burgess Junction, basically Sheridan. And this line went up to Paw Paw, which connected with the Chicago and Rock River, which ran from Shabana. Yes, there was a track from Shabana to Paw Paw and then up to Rock Falls Sterling. And then it, it did a little jog on the Northwestern and then ended up over at Denrock again. This is kind of the same view, just maybe a little clearer. This is out of an official uh, track diagram book issued by the Burlington in my possession. This is a 1958-59, and here's Earlville. Now you see by, I think it's 59, the line to Burgess Junction is truncated at Baker. And I believe that happened in the fine print there, it says 1958. And the line from Paw Paw to Shabana is now gone, and that came out in 32. Uh, the, the Depression was an impetus to cut a lot of lines. Now we're, we're starting to drill down. This is out of a LaSalle County plat map in my possession, my collection. And yeah. Here's Earlville, <clears throat> this way to Aurora, Mendota, Galesburg. This is the line down to Burgess Junction. This is the line up to Rock Falls, Sterling, Paw Paw. This is the Chicago Northwestern coming through this way. Um, note, there's no connecting tracks here at the Northwestern Crossing at Earlville. You have a connecting track here, but it's only one way coming south, coming north, or going south to Burgess. There's only one leg of what was called a Y here. Uh, we'll get into this actual crossing of the branch and the main line in a minute. Now we drill down another level. Here's the town of Earlville. And I was telling Tom, we drove around a little bit uh, this morning before we came in. This area was just full, and you'll see later on that these number of tracks even grew more. And this is, you know, to serve all the local industry, the stores. And there's uh, this connecting here to the Burgess line. There's a passing track here. And here's the Northwestern over here. And this, they, the, whoever printed, edited this uh, plat map, they spent the time to, to identify each and every store, which was I found kind of interesting. This is the track diagram again, uh, drilling down. And here again, here's, here's the local service tracks, the line to Burgess. Note that the crossing is gone. Here's the Northwestern. Now we have all of this here. And these are... Uh, but this track right here was called the Westward Storage. This track is the Westward Siding. This is the Eastward Siding. This industry spur, which I just read the history of on the wall of the electric company that was here, I never remember, never saw a car, a freight car put in there. I, they had a nice spur. I don't know that they ever shipped by rail. I'm going to show you a quick series of photos of local depots, and I want you to pay certain attention to certain aspects. And then I'll tell you why. Notice the roof line, three windows. This is Samanak. Roof line, three windows, Leland.
Plano. Roof line, three windows. Meriden. Three windows in the bay. That's the operator's bay. This picture of Earlville. Three windows. No second story. I was telling Chris, I have never ever in all my research seen a Burlington station board like that before. They're always on the end. I believe, and maybe you, you folks here locally can tell me, let's go back a couple. Is that the Burlington Depot? That's the Burlington Depot. We know that. The Northwestern. I'll show you the Northwestern in a second. Notice, I'll call it board and batten. And Tom and I have probably spent more time in the Plano Depot than we care to remember at Lion Farm. But this is the original siding on all of these depots that I just showed you. Those are actual rough sawn boards, and I'll call it, I'm not a carpenter, but I'll call it the batten in between. The key here is these depots, we know this to be a fact, were all built in Chicago in a modular style and brought out and erected along the line as the line was built. It looks like Stewart. So they're all very similar. This is definitely the uh, Burlington Depot because of the three windows and the, the background. You can see this is part, I'll show you in another view, this is part of town. I'm going to say this only because it's, it's an assumption on my part after looking at all those other depots. I believe that your depot was remodeled early. That's a much nicer siding on that depot and the agent's quarters are gone. So I don't know if you have an earlier photo of this depot, but I think this depot was rebuilt, remodeled early on based on all those other photos and what we, we know from our research. Um, of course, this is the event of the day, the train's coming, and the, the, the baggage wagon and the station helpers are out to not only unload baggage, but these trains carried express. And express can be any number of things, from flowers, produce, Anything that someone needed to ship in a hurry would go express on a passenger train. And I'll get into the other class of package service in a little bit. I notice the siding is horizontal and not vertical on that. Yeah, the siding is horizontal, it's not vertical. Right. Um, and it's, it's lapped. Yes. This, this is newer. This depot got remodeled fairly early in its history. And I can say that with confidence because there's Meriden, which is the next station to the west. And everything to the east, they all have this same design of the siding. And again, I'm not using the correct term, but I call it the, I'll use gingerbread, but, but this support system. And when you look at the Earlville Depot, these early pictures, it's not there. And yet we know these depots were all built and brought out in sections and walls. There's looking the other way. This is going to be, I believe he's going eastbound. And this probably is the local drayman who was hired by the railroad to <coughs> deliver whatever express, etc. is on this train. And of course, the arrival of the train is always an event. There's always people coming and going. And a lot of times, just go down to the depot and watch the train because that's that was the place to go in town. Go back to the other photograph of the depot. One more. One more? One more. Okay, go ahead. The uh, station board is now on the end of the depot instead of over the freight door. On the newer one. Yeah. See now the now the station board. I think it's board. the same building. 
the, the chimneys there. Yeah, it's the same building. Yeah, yeah. It's just and about when when you see the picture of the Northwestern people, you'll know right away. Leo, it might be worth. Uh, I'm probably most people in here know this, but it might be worth mentioning that the the depot was in the middle of the tracks there, as opposed to where it is now, on the north side. Yeah, it was on the south side, and. I'll call it the local, the delivery, the industry tracks were behind the depot. Back up one slide, please. <coughs> one more. Okay. Oh, one, one more. One more. There. There's your your uh, industry or your local service no. tracks behind the depot. More. Okay. One more. No. no. That's good. This is the new depot across the main on the north side. And you'll see this when we get into the laying of the original tracks. Like that's like 1910 maybe? Well, I was just going to go there. When they built these? You have a photo back on the wall back there that says 1918. I couldn't access a disc we have of station records in our, in our society. We, some of us. I have personal copies. I couldn't find mine. I depended on a member to give me a date. He told me 1913. I'm thinking his 1913 was probably year 1918. And I believe, wasn't the Plano Depot built in 17 and 18, if I remember correctly? Princeton was 12. Princeton was? 1912. Okay, well, then it could be 13. They're, they're Somewhere around around the same. Around. Typically, what happened is the local town commerce committee, the, the mayor's aldermen, as the towns grew, they would have to literally go to the railroad and say, hey, this is all the business we're generating for you. We would like a new depot. And there was always this back and forth. I mean, the railroad, being conservatively run, is not going to just jump and build you a depot. So it took a while, and, and it, there was a lot of back and forth. <coughs> just another picture under construction. Um, the temp oh. nope. temporary platform. All the trees are gone. Too. All the trees. I'm assuming we'll see in future pictures. I'll go on record and say these must have all been elves. There's the, the, the old and the new. And you can see that they were literally right across from each other. And I'm going to make a prediction, and I'll depend on you local people to tell me otherwise. The pattern on the Burlington in scores and scores of cases was for this depot to get picked up, moved, and turned into a freight house. When I say freight house, everyone know what I'm talking about? Okay. Freight house is where the LCL cars were placed. I see a lot of blank looks. LCL is less than car load. So think back to this hardware store. When the man who ran this hardware store needed to fill his shelves, he wrote his wholesalers. They went to the Burlington, one of the Burlington 12 freight houses in Chicago, depending on where they were located, and they handed packages to the agents at the freight house addressed to this hardware store. They went in a boxcar, and then that boxcar gets transitioned to a few through a few more freight houses, and that package comes and goes out of different cars, and it finally, at Aurora, goes in. The Aurora Freight House gets put in a specific boxcar going to Earlville and gets placed at the freight house here. When the station helpers in the freight house at Earlville unload that car, they take the packages in. The agent fills out a literally a postcard and sends it to the hardware store and says, your packages are here, come and get them. And I have some of those postcards in my collection, which will be a future article someday. Camera couldn't slow this guy down. 
that I, I put this in because of this. This was, unfortunately, a lot of times caskets were hauled in the baggage cars of passenger trains. And I can tell you from talking with baggage men who worked in baggage cars, they, they didn't look forward to it. Anybody tell me what this wood post is? Mail? I can't. For the mail? Mail. Mail. That's the mail pickup. That's the hook, <laughs> the hook for grabbing the bag. And the uh, RPO clerk, as he's grabbing the bag with the hook on the side of the RPO car, at his foot he's kicking off the, the bag of mail for Earlville. I, I'll ask again local knowledge. Is this the spur that went to the electric company or the power plant? I don't ever remember a track being on the north side. Well, there it is. And I, I believe I believe it went to the power, whatever the power plant, water plant, uh, the electric generating plant must have been, you know, over here somewhere. It was. It was. What a pretty station. It really was. Three windows. <laughs> Three windows. Yeah. And the roof was all tile. And all tile. Yep. Because the steam engine, like they threw shit in the air, come down on the roof. And... There's still um, the railroad put another roof on there, but there's still pieces in the basement. Is there of the tile? You know. Plano's roof is still tile. Yeah. yeah. This is a much later, but here again, we're waiting for the train, a nice crowd waiting for the train, and there's the station helper out, ready, ready to move packages and baggage. This is uh, a 1970 shot taken from uh, the south side, right in here. Uh, that's the, what we call the Baker Main. That went out, curved, then went on down to Baker and originally to Burgess Junction. Uh, the house track, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that later on. This is the crossing watchman's tower. And back in the day before the fine state of electronics, um, he literally raised and lowered the gates as trains approached. Here's this, I think, is part of, that's why I say the, the power plant was over here, something. This, this looks like some kind of an unloading feature here. Right. And of course, one of the two elevators. This is the interlocking tower that was at the Northwestern and the Burlington Crossing. Yeah, it's like an hour, Alex. In 1965, CTC was extended to the west end of Earlville, and that was the end of the tower. Uh, the tower was manned 24-7 by uh, Q operators, uh, and I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. Um, this switch is the switch to the Baker Main, uh, the Northwestern. Here's the Y, the west leg of the Y. The east leg of the Y is over here out of the picture, and I'll explain those later on. This gizmo right here is a train order board. That means this, there were no orders for this train. If one of those arms or both of those arms were horizontal, then the crew on the train knows that the operator from up in the tower here has got paper train orders for him. And God help you if you don't catch them. You can't go by. You have to stop. You have to embarrassly back up and get those train orders because they tell you what's coming or what to do. This is what it looks like inside of one of those towers. This is the, this is the tower at Montgomery. Uh, Marty Bernard is the operator. Marty's a, a member of our society. This was taken 9-12 of 64, two weeks before the horrendous Montgomery wreck, which this tower played a key role in. But this shows you the effort that these men had to put in to throw the switches and the signals. And I'll back up one to explain why. 
right there and right here are what are called the rods. And those levers in the tower, you literally moved rods, steel rods. That, like these are connected to this signal. These would go to the switch for the Y. The, the signal maintainer spent a huge amount of time doing nothing more than oiling all these rods all the time so that they would throw when the, when the operator threw them. This is the Northwestern Depot. The Northwestern Depot is west and a little bit south, was a little bit south of town. Uh, this is a picture of, I'm assuming, a, a farmer, but it could be the local drayman, picking up LCL out of the freight room at the Northwestern Depot. This is how LCL was tremendously labor intensive, handled the same part for a, a tractor or a hay mow or whatever could be handled six, seven times from origin to destination. LCL was um, profitable, but extremely labor intensive for the railroads to handle. Where did you say that was located? This, this was located south of the crossing, a little bit south of the elevator, the big elevator on the west end. Um, maybe it shows, I might show up in a map here, but that's, it was just, just south a little bit. Here's what it looked like. Well, here's the, here's, this will give you some gauge. That, that was the big elevator on the west end of town, and this is 54. So you can kind of gauge from there where it was. So I did some research using the, the timetables. By the way, uh, due to the generosity of certain members and my per persistence in finding them, I have a collection from 39 till the 70 merger of every Aurora Division timetable. So I can kind of do this kind of research uh, sitting at my desk at home. So I didn't. I was going to put up a bunch of the time cards, but they don't show well in a vid, in a slide. So here, without me delineating, just go ahead and read the progression, the changes in service here at Earl over the decades. I just picked certain years at random. Yes, in my messy collection, I do have an 1878 and an 1895 timetable. The, the very sad thing about anything from here up, you touch them and they start falling apart, literally. This was the one that I kind of surprised me. As late as 1964, there's still a passenger train, and again, referring to the timetables, in the fine print, it says number such and such will stop at Earlville to embark and detrain passengers from points west of this and going farther than that east uh, upon, upon signal called a conditional stop. So it, was, it wasn't a scheduled stop, it was like if he was told ahead of time that he had passengers for Earlville and or pick up, then he'd stop at Earlville. But that was the last um, passenger train that did any stopping at Earlville whatsoever. Now we're going to talk about the branch lines. So. Sterling to Pawpaw to Earlville to Serena and then back that whole way is one local passenger train. In 1926, this was turned from a, a steam train with a baggage car and a coach to a motor car. A motor car is a single unit. I'm sure you've seen pictures of them. Uh, by the way, 
Over there in Bulletin 54 is an article with lots of pictures and a whole history. And all of this came again through the generosity. Having worked for the railroad, having been a union steward for a while, the local union in Aurora was going to throw their files out and throw them in the dumpster. And a friend of mine, I was riding to my job in Chicago on the suburban trains, the Dinkies, he sat down on my neck one day like he always did, and we're chit-chatting, he says, the lodge is going to throw out the grievance files. I looked at him, I said, no they're not, give them to me. Half, no, three quarters of them now reside in our archive. And going through these files, it's amazing what I can learn. This train left Sterling at 5.20 in the morning. He got back at 8.20 at night, if he's on time. And they often work. And the crew can only work 16 hours a day. So they'd leave Sterling, go to Shabana, leave Shabana, go to Earlville, go down to Serena. Now he's got a four hour layover at Serena. But what's interesting is he can connect with the passenger trains on the Fox River branch so if you want to ride, the, if you live in Earlville and you want to ride to Rock Island, you can catch the motor car and you can ride down to Serena, you can catch the Fox River motor car, go to Ottawa and catch the Rock Island. <laughs> or let's say you want to go to St. Paul, you can ride over to Shabana and catch the trains on what we call the CNI, the North Line, and you can go to St. Paul or all points north. Um, obviously in Earlville you can catch all the main line trains going east and west. Uh, they worked 15 hours, 16 hours a day, six days a week. So they had Sunday off, and you can connect, a, you know, at these points to these different trains. Um, connect here to Earlville, Ottawa. You, you connect a streeter to the Santa Fe trains. Now, does this take you a day or so just to make the connections? Yeah, it's not like you can jump in your car and get there. And that's what killed these kind of trains, as. Everyone bought their Model T, then these trains died off. But in my article are pages out of the union files, and you will see the tremendous amount of business that these trains carried. Not only did they carry express and mail, they, they carried bread. They had meat on the train, veal. They carried milk cans. The lifeblood of, of these small towns were carried on these trains. By 1933, again, the, between the Depression and the widespread purchasing of automobiles, the, the local passenger trains are gone. The only thing left on this line that you can ride is the way freight, which is basically unscheduled, so God help you when you think you might get there. Here's the 1926 maps, again, blown up a little better, showing the, the lines right here at Earlville. The, the routes to the various places. Local freights serving Earlville. They were called way freights. That was the, the Burlington's term for a local freight. The Northwestern called them scoots. Other railroads had other names. Uh, the same thing applied to cabooses. Every railroad had a name other than caboose for their cabooses. On the Burlington, you, you never said caboose. You said way car. If you went to work and looked at the conductor and said, where's the caboose, he'd say, you work here? Um, over the decades, the times and origin and endpoints of these, these locals changed, depending on the level of business. But roughly, here, this was probably the most Im impressive one or the most interesting one that I stumbled on. And again, I stumbled on this in the union files many years ago. It was called the Roustabout. Every way freight had a nickname. This one, the roustabout. Why the roustabout? That was a term for something that goes everywhere. He literally started out in Mendota, came up to Earlville, went over to Pawpaw, over to Shabana, came back to Earlville, goes down to Baker, goes to Burgess, goes to Ottawa, returns to Earlville, and then goes back to Mendota. All in one shift. And he's a local freight train, and he's, he's working along the line he was, he was technically not a way freight. The only place he switched cars was at Baker. He served Baker Feeds and the elevator. Everywhere else, 
he's shut, shut, shuttling, shunting blocks of cars between other trains that connect at all these points. And the reason I stumbled on this was the conductor on the job wrote a letter to his union steward called a griever saying, do you see how many stops we're making and how many cars we're handling every night? This is a night job in the middle of the night, midnight to 5 a.m. or whatever. And he says, I'm working for through freight pay. I want way freight pay. He never got way freight pay. A little higher pay rate. Right? Um, at some point over the decades, this would switch. Sometimes the job was based in Mendona. Sometimes it was based out of Ottawa. It would flip back and forth. The Rock Falls way freight for many, many decades, started out of Yola, went to Earlville, went up the branch to Rock Falls, he would return the next day. In 1966, it changes and he runs from Rock Falls to Earlville back to Rock Falls in a round trip. And that's because my favorite job on the whole railroad that I got to work for three months was the Earlville turn, came on in 1966 and worked Yola to Earlville to Yola six days a week off on Sunday. There's where we spent all our time, right there was Cat at Montgomery. Out of a 12-hour shift, we'd spend 9, 10 hours in Cat. Here's a picture of the Rock Falls way freight. I believe, and I could be wrong, but I believe this is coming into Rock Falls. And this was when he made the round trip Rock Falls to Earlville. This is the Rock Falls Way Freight in the late 60s. He's coming around the curve to get onto the Northwestern. He's coming south into Earlville from Rock Falls. And here's his local business here that he's picked up along the line. Back here is all the sinkers, all the heavy stuff coming out of Surly. And these gondolas are all full of finished steel. I worked this job for a week and it was amazing uh, what Northwestern Steel and Wire made. Uh, for an early electric furnace. I was surprised what they shipped. And this was a, a manual switch. You had to get out and throw it. First off, you couldn't come out here until you had gotten clearance. And there's the phone uh, where you can call the, the tower or you can call the dispatcher and say, hey, we're here. Can we come out on the Northwestern? He, he'd give you clearance to come out or say, no, you got to wait. This is the Earlville turn in 1967, doing what we call West work. He's, he's, he's got the local cars for Earlville, Sandwich, Samanac, you name it, Leland. Um, this, this is another source that's near and dear to me. Every train and engine member who worked on trains kept what was called a time book. I went to an, uh, an estate sale one day and R.K. Johnson's time books were sitting on a table tucked in a corner and everybody walked by that didn't know what they were. I took one look, that was the main thing I walked out of that auction with. Why? Because here's his time book from 1954 and he's working the Rock Falls Way Freight and I can doc he documents for me the 16 hours he's on duty going west and the job was set up so that they would do all the local work up the branch from Earlville to Rock Falls, all the elevators, lumber yards, whatever, going west or north. And then they'd lay over in, in Rock Falls, sleep in the way car, and coming back the next day, they wanted to get home. So they had done all the local switching going up, and now they, they call it running. Except running still meant you were on duty eight or nine hours, some days uh, 10, 11 hours, even on the short day. Um, this was a long, Every day he's, you know, he's 15, 12, 13, looks like, I can't tell, 15, 18, uh, and they're off on Sundays. I'll bet, how many people in this room knew that at one time there were three mains at Earlville? Anybody? Well, now you know. From 1929 to 1932, there were three mains at Earlville. From just west of the Northwestern Crossing here at Earlville to MS Tower in Mendota. The thing I can't tell you, and I've talked to one of our members who's a retired electrical signal department employee 
and he puts my collections to shame, I asked him, I said, Glenn, which side of the current mains was the third main? He said, I don't know for sure. Uh, about the same time, a fourth main was built from Yola to Downers Grove, Illinois. I've had arguments with members of my society telling me that I don't know what I'm talking about. I have the documents. They're in the timetable. There were also three mains from Watauga to Galesburg. So why, between 28 and when they were pulled out in 32, 33, did the Burlington add all these additional mains? Anybody? Why would they need all these this extra capacity? The three mains was coming out of Galesburg. Down yeah, but prior to this, prior to 28, there were only two. Mm -hmm. During the 1920s, they didn't call the, what was the term for the 20s, the Roaring 20s? They used that term because business-wise, that's exactly what was going on. The railroad had so much business, they had to add capacity. And this is before all modern electronics and CTC, where the dispatcher sits in Dallas now and can throw switches in Chicago electronically. Back then, you had to have the towers. You had to have the physical capacity. So in the mid-20s, I mean, it takes several years. You've got to have the engineering department. You've got to have everybody involved. You've got to get the material. You've got to build it. So by 28, 29, they're putting in these extra mains. And then 32, 33, they start pulling them out. Anybody tell me why? The Depression. Business went from way up here to way down there in four years. Just crashed. Here's a picture for all those doubters. Here's a picture of the four mains. This is about uh, the west edge of Naperville. One of our members, who's a retired engineer, identified it right here with that, those white posts. He said that, that fence was a Naperville golf club for many, many years. He said that's where that's taken. So I don't have a picture of the three mains for Earlville, but you can imagine, you know, just picture three, three beautiful mains on absolutely spotless, high speed maintained, 90, 100, 110 mile an hour track. Yes, they ran that speed all the time. My personal recollections of Earlville working the uh, Rock Falls job and the Earlville turn. The Rock Falls job went to Baker uh, as needed. So we, we come into Earlville, we'd leave all the stuff for Rock Falls on one of the sidings west of town, and then we take the cars for Baker and go down to Baker and then come back and go on to Rock Falls. I was telling Tom this story this morning. In 1974, I was with the crew, we spotted an IH combine on the platform on the house track. Anybody here remember the platform? It would have been across from the depot and a little bit east. Mm -hmm. And you could put a flat car up there and they could drive that, the farm machinery right off. Uh, I suspect that was probably about the last one that came to town. And what struck me was IH built these in the Quad Cities, which is, as a crow flies, 50 miles. That's a very short move for a railroad car. It was right across the tracks from the John Deere combine. The Sioux line took care of it. <laughs> that, that same year, uh, we used to come to town here at Earlville, do our, our local work in Earlville. Uh, mainly it was spotting loads of fertilizer on some of the side tracks downtown. Uh, I can't remember spotting anything else, but I do remember fertilizer. So we're sitting in what's called the clear one day, as the dispatcher said, no, you can't come back out, you've got to sit there because i got too much mainline traffic. And so we were one of the few crews left that was cooking in, in our way car. So we're in the clear, we're tied up, we're going to cook dinner. And pretty soon the conductor walks off and disappears while the two brakemen are cooking dinner. He comes back and he says, hey, I talked to the section foreman over at the depot because um, he had seen some bricks missing in the, in the south platform, the eastbound platform. And we have permission to take bricks out of the platform as long as we don't take them from this certain section. And he said, we got an empty flat car. I want you two boys to load up a bunch of bricks on the flat car for me so I have bricks for my patio at home. And that's exactly what we proceeded to do. <laughs> the only problem was there were no sideboards on the flat car. It, it, had just, uh, it may have been the flat car that, that we had spotted the IH car 
combine on a couple days before. So it had no, no sideboards, nothing. It was just a flat, flatbed flat car. Well, we went 50, 60 miles an hour back to Earlville. I mean, back to Caterpillar. What do you think happened to a lot of those bricks as we're going down the main road? <laughs> bum, 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 bum. They were airborne. And I just kept waiting for some car to cross him to have his windshield knocked out. All right, it's time for me to quit. I have one little tell you, one little story here. This gentleman sticking his head out here, this is a photo I made in 68, 69, when I'm in high school, sitting by the tracks one afternoon. This is the Aurora Depot engine headed out to Yola to get a bunch of freight cars to bring it back to Aurora. This gentleman right here is Neil Zaborowski. Neil Zaborowski ended up being my brakeman six, eight, ten years later, working for me when I was a conductor. Questions? Steam engines? Mm -hmm. When did they end? Mm -hmm. 55, 56, I don't think 57. 55, 56, there was a big grain rush. They took steam locomotives that had been in storage in Galesburg. They put them in the roundhouses, fired them up, got them back in service. That was the last time steam engines in this area were in regular service, right around 55, 56 for the grain rush. So that would have been September, August, September, October, maybe into November. And after that, the only steam engines left were the excursion. The, the 5632, uh, 4960, the 6310 came through here a couple times, but then it threw a side rod, and that was the end of the 6310. They were so exciting. They were so, so exciting <laughs> compared to the ones now. Yes and no. Uh, there was a, amongst us railroaders, there was a conductor who was famous for his euphemisms, outlook, and thoughts about the railroad. This man was a, was a modeler, was a member of our society till he passed, was an old, old time conductor. He, he was a premier modeler, and he could share with you anything that happened on the railroad from even before he started working. And one day I'm working with him at West Chicago, switching General Mills, and we get a break and we're sitting around and we're chatting and he's telling one of his stories and he had, all of us who sat and listened to his stories regret that we didn't have a tape recorder. The stories were unbelievable. Um, but he said to me, he said, you know, Leo, you're a modeler, right? I said, yeah. He said, I worked on those damn steam engines. He says, I don't understand why people love those damn, stinky, dirty, rotten, <laughs> cold steam engines. He said, in the summer you boiled to death, in the winter you froze to death, and you, you had to have, you know, a hat, scarves, gloves, all covered up because of all the damn soot falling on you all the time. He said, you were filthy all the time. He said, I don't get it why people don't think the diesels are so much better. <laughs> that was, but he modeled steam engines and he built models of steam engines. That steam engine could kill you any time. Just a you, big, you let that, big you let that of boiling water. You let that boiling water yeah. drain, run out and that crown sheet go dry, you're dead. It said there's three valves. If you hit the bottom one and there's no water, you jump. You know, the top one tells you you're pretty full and then the middle one. If you got nothing coming out the bottom, you better jump. Yeah, you better, you better, as a fireman, you better know what you're doing or you're going to kill your crew. Yeah. On that timetable there, you know, I work the track department, so we're always looking, you know, track related. But did I tell you the steam engine, where the water was, where the coal was? Everything. Everything. Uh, there's columns. Well, here. Promise that you have clean hands. <laughs> the oldest one I got is 1934. When they ran the go in, go right here, and you'll see the you'll see the uh, on this side, you'll see the symbols, and that will tell you if there's coal or water, if there's a Y in the town, mail cranes. It, it tell you all. You have to know the codes. You have to learn the codes. Yeah. But those Ys and Ws and Cs. Uh, and all, there's there's a whole alphabet there. 
and it'll tell you what's in the town. Yes? I toured the place down at Galesburg, the Railroad Museum and that, a few years ago. Um, I can't say for sure how long. But they told us that they were going to be doing away with actual engineers and they were going to computerize. Is this in service or? I have this conversation. I still work in the industry, uh, even though people want me to retire, but I enjoy what I do. But anyway, I have this conversation on a regular basis. They have this new feature that's been put in in the last 10 years. It, it has taken that long to, to install it along all the railroads. It's called Positive Train Control, PTC. The computer can stop that engine anytime it wants. They could theoretically get rid of train crews. They, they could run trains without a crew on them. Um, given that the computer and the dispatcher and the computers can control everything. Um, Ultimately, I believe someday out in the future that is management's goal. Uh, right now, there's a, a battle going on between the unions, the operating unions, and management. Management wants to go down to one member, one man on a train, the engineer only. They they want to do away with the conductor up there with the engineer. Uh, the unions are fighting it. Uh, They're getting a the black eye. The railroads are getting the black eye of all these new yeah. um, so The bad wreck out in Palestine, Ohio, yeah. may put all of that on the back burner for a while. Okay. Um, but again, and my brother worked 43 years on the railroad, and he and I have these conversations. And he goes, well, what if da da? And what if da da? And I go, give the technology time. Like any technology, they'll find a way to adapt that technology to that situation. I think it'll come someday. I mean, if you get on an airplane, realize that that pilot, a lot of the flight is just sitting there letting the computer fly that plane. This, I, think, I think that'll be the next step on the railroads, is there'll be an engineer up there, but the computer will be running that train. Uh, one of the reasons is that computer with the database and the links can control the throttle positions on that locomotive more accurately than the human for fuel consumption. And that's one of the big goals on the railroad. They now award rail engineers, I want to say it's monetary checks based on how efficiently they run their trains. I can tell you it was a whole lot different when I was out there. One of the favorite things for a high-speed engineer to do, who could no longer run a passenger train because we didn't have any, was to try to run his freight train like a passenger train. And it was called a power stop. And he would, he would run that locomotive in eight, stretch the train out so that all the slack and all the couplers is all stretched out. It's called stretching the train out. And then he'd start setting the air and leave that throttle run in eight for a while, and then he'd start backing down on it. And that's, that's how you stop the passenger train, was that train all stretch, brake set, and start slowly backing off the throttle. Well, you're, you're throwing a lot of fuel out the stacks to make a, a grandstand stop. The computers now with the... Optimizer. Optimizer and... Um, I can't think of the name. The, the, you put the, you throw the reverser in neutral dynamic brake dynamic brake with the dynamic brakes they can use the force in the engine to slow the train down with just gravity force you don't even have to set I mean at some point you have to set the brakes but you can use a lot less air and a lot less throttle and let the dynamic brakes do the work for you dynamic brakes changes the polarity of the electric motor so to make the electric motor run clockwise, the field has to turn clockwise. Well, when they put it in dynamic braking, even though the wheels are turning clockwise, the field is turning counterclockwise, and that creates 
like resistance down, down shifting train and, it, and it mm -hmm. slows the train down. That's why you hear them whine so much when they come into the station because they have it's like a toaster. Yes. Envision a toaster and they have these big fans and the big fans when this thing runs in reverse it's creating all kinds of heat and the little fins that would toast your bread and those fans have to come on they got to blow that heat out to keep the thing from catching fire. So. Anyone else? I didn't know that story, but I I, can, I, I was in the 80s or the 90s. I probably 79. That could have been. The winter, Red Brewer. I, I, I can tell you some horrendous stories about the winter of 1977, 78, and 78, 79. Yeah. I was out there. Up with the Sterling Branch. You oh. When they got the they had, got the rotary plow stuck. We they had a, it, they took it up the rock. Floor. We had a Jordan spreader derailed on the Sterling Branch. They sent the 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 uh, over by Papa between Papa and they, What's the name of that? The the the, the plow with the the, the, the blades. Uh, rotary. The rotary. The rotary yeah. They sent the rotary up to rescue the Jordan spreader that was on the ground. They put the rotary on the ground. Yeah. They ended up they ended up coming in with caterpillars to plow out the Sterling Branch. In the winter time on the Sterling Branch, we had to go out and pick the crossings, all the flanges, oh. gravel roads. Yeah. In the winter, yeah. it would freeze, and it picked the car. You know, the Jordan better and just it laid it on its side. Did you spend any time on the Denrock Branch in 19 yeah. January 1979? In '76, I worked. Denrock. In 1979, I got called for a, a plow train. We worked in Amboy in '79, '80. We went, we went, we did nothing for 12 hours, but run from Mendota to Denrock and back and back and back, doing nothing but shoving the snow plow for 12 hours. With Dale's over? To keep that branch open. Would you with the snow, over? sitting in the cab of the locomotive, you were looking out at the top of the snow banks. That's how deep, and I'm not lying. You would come up to a crossing, and it was like a tunnel at the crossing. How people didn't get hit head up, you know, constantly at these, the snow was 10, 10, 12 feet deep along the, because it would, that branch ran in such a way, call it a northwest angle, that that north wind and that west wind would just fill in every, the Rock Falls branch was the same way. Every cut on the branch, it was just like a snow making machine. It would, it would the snow would blow along the fields and it get to the cut and it blew, between and, uh, Mendoza and Zering. The and track the, got stuck in oh, yeah. 14. Yeah. Yeah, I was a track rider then. Yeah. Got a question one, back one here. Right here. here. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the way all of our roads were around here. Once yeah. that snow came down, you came to a corner. You couldn't see either way. Yeah. You eased into the junction. Yeah. Uh, in a former life, I worked for Rock Island and I worked for Illinois Central uh, as a yard clerk. And the story I had was in Illinois Central, we would take a wagon, pull it out, load stuff off of it, then pull it back over the tracks to the station. Well, we lost the bag, apparently. And you didn't mention security. We had cinder dicks all over the place. And what's going on? And he said, you've lost a money bag. <laughs> and the one guy said, you can't. And before he got his hands up, he had a... a, a <laughs> a handcuff on He said, oh, I guess you can. <laughs> they found it when we pulled it around. It had fallen off the bag or the, the truck and uh, onto the ground, and it was laying out there. But they were, they were real serious. Do any of you remember a, a possibility of a fire in your depot? No. The old wooden depot? What depot? The wooden one, the original wooden one that had the different Where? siding on it than everybody else. Because the eaves on that building and those photographs, the eaves on that building were shorter. They weren't. Those long decorative pieces of gingerbread were to support the big eaves that hung off the building. That's what 
you could park baggage wagons next to the building and keep them dry. But on those pictures where your siding was lapped, those eaves were only maybe 18, 20 inches, which would tell me that there was once a fire in the depot and burnt the roof off of it. And they rebuilt the roof. A retired fire the roof. We built that. <laughs> when they rebuilt the roof, then they, they put a more conventional roof on it, and also they upgraded the outside of the building because it was probably damaged. I would, I would guess that there was a, it's not uncommon for there to be a stove fire in a wooden depot. And then I would tell you that they're just looking at those photographs, that at some point your depot had a fire in it, and they put a new roof on it. That old wooden one that's gone, that, that's, they, they put a new roof on it. That was not the same roof right. on both of those buildings at all. That's why I had him keep going back and forth, looking at the depth of the uh, eaves on the roof. Leave it to, leave it to a retired fireman. To, yeah. I call it remodeling. He calls it a fire. <laughs> He's probably right. I mean, at some at some point, there, there's I mean, maybe check with your fire department and see if they have records that go back that far. Well, spend several hours doing the research in your local newspaper. It's probably in there somewhere. Yeah. What would the date span be? Yeah, finding it would be. Yeah. 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 How much time do you have? <laughs> yeah. I'd like to know who the fellow is up here that where he's from that worked at, on the railroad with all the information. That would be you with the hat. Me? <laughs> yeah. Where are you from? I'm retired. Where are you um, from? Track inspector. I'm from Mendota. <laughs> I live in Bureau. I live in Bureau County, not too far from the Are you the gentleman that came to me one day and, and said you bad ordered the caterpillar lead? I used to all the time. <laughs> that, that was my job: take stuff out of service, yep. fix it, or put a speed on it. Would you have been referred to as a snuffy? A snuffy? <laughs> no, that's operating crews only. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. Was it against the law for you men to carry shotguns on the train? Oh, you want to, you want me to tell that story? <laughs> well, I saw it. You saw it? I farm north of, if you take the, the uh, Sterling, yep. the days when you hold all that wire back and forth, I farm three miles north of town, three or four miles right up next to the railroad, back in the pheasant hunting days when we had a lot of game. <laughs> all right. You I'm going to tell the story real quick. <laughs> you, you fill in the part I miss. The gentleman's name was Gabby Watson. He was the conductor on the Rock Falls Way Freight. And it was pheasant season. And in these days, the, the crews, the train crews slept in their way carts. That was their role with, that was their home. Well, you got to cook when you get to Sterling Rock, while well, they tied up in Rock Falls. So, what are we going to have for dinner? Well, it's pheasant season, so Gabby, uh, that's his nickname, I won't use his real name, Gabby brings a shotgun, and the engineer, and Gabby had it worked out, that the engineer would let Gabby know, probably with a whistle tube, that there were pheasants about. And as the weight car got to the pheasants, Gabby would let go, and then they'd stop, and they'd load up a couple of pheasants, and then they'd go on. Well, this went on for a while, and someone locally, <laughs> someone locally complained to the game warden. One day they're going along and they got their game going and they stop, pick up their pheasants, and when they stop to go get the pheasants, the game warden greeted Gabby. said, hello, how are you today, sir? Uh, I'll take your gun. And... I forget what all happened. He, they took his gun, he got fined. Somehow, and wherever you've worked in the past, you probably knew people who you thought had a, an angel, a guardian <laughs> angel sitting on their shoulder. The railroad was famous for discipline. The railroad was very much like the military, because that's what they were based on when they developed. Mm -hmm. And we went through very structured hearings when you were accused of some fault, breaking a rule or doing something you weren't supposed to do. 
I never heard what happened to Gabby internally on the railroad as a result of that incident. But that story was very prevalent when I worked on the railroad. <laughs> that and a whole, many, many other stories. But that's, that's the Gabby pheasant. Oh, here's, here's the crowning finish to that story. Back in those days, the switchman in the yards, you chalked cars. Big, big, I did it in the 70s. You wrote symbols or names on the cars because especially if you're switching in the rain, your, your paper list is crumbling in your hand. And so there was a system of symbols and names written on things so that you knew what to do with it. And, you know, you switch it once, switch it twice, three, four times you'd handle a car before you got it in the right train where you wanted it. Well, the same thing applied to weight cars. At Yola, which was the base for many of the way freights, there was a way car track. And the yard master would sell, tell the switch foreman, go to the way car track and get the Rock Falls way freight. Way car. Well, the Rock Falls way freight way car did not say Rock Falls on it. After the pheasant hunting incident, there were some artists on the railroad. They chalked in the crayon chalk so that it wouldn't wash off. Well, there was, there was a fireman at Yola who was a very good uh, artist. He really was. And I, I have one of his drawings in my office. Very <coughs> special to me because it shows my grandfather at work. But I, I believe this was the individual who went out and spent some time drew a beautiful pheasant on the side of the car. <laughs> and from that day on, everyone knew where the Rock Falls, which, which way car was the Rock Falls way, way, way car. Now you put um, roast, roast about something, the cars went to Mendota and then they went back. Now there was the turn table there in Mendota. Yes. Well, yeah, I remember that. I don't know how many other people remember, but it's right across from where Ziggy's Restaurant was. That's where the yeah. turntable was. The, the turntable was used 99.9% .9 of the time for locomotives. Once in a blue moon, uh, the only time I remember at Yola turning a car was when the, the car had been loaded in a certain pattern, and a, the door on one side was the door that you had to unload from, and the, the car was situated wrong for the, the consignee to unload it. So the local brought it back, we had to turn it on the turntable, and then they took it back to the, the factory to have them unload it. That's the only time I remember turning a car on a turntable. What was Billy's train? What was Billy's train? Everything that we read about the railroad um, back in the 20s, in 30s. Mendoza Centennial. Before. Okay. And he ran from Mendoza to Chicago. Okay. Every day, I think. talking about getting on the Billy's, Billy's train. We made round trip, you know, from here. Okay, so they Billy was Billy's train. Let's Billy was probably the conductor on the yeah. job. Yeah. And probably been on the job forever. Okay. Uh, my guess is, and I'm going strictly from assumptions seeing what I've seen in the timetables and the union files. There was a local that came out of Mendota every morning called the shop train. That was, that's what it was called by the crews up and around Aurora. And Aurora was the base for all these crews all over northern Illinois. Um, the shop train started out of Mendota and made every stop to Aurora. And they called it the shop train because a lot of the, some of the residents along the main line between Aurora and, and Mendota worked in the Aurora shops. And this is how they came and went to their job in the Aurora shops. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was literally in the union files, it was, it, yeah, it would, it would be called number such and such, but its nickname was the shop trainer. I lived in Samanoff, and I heard it was a billing Okay. You know, you're talking about fuel consumption a while ago, in the either late 80s or uh, late 70s or real early 80s. I live in Sandwich, okay? And on the east end of Sandwich, people uh, around here don't know where uh, Indian Spring Shopping Center is, between the East End Sandwich and the shopping center, I was going towards Plano, the train stopped there, and a, uh, I think it was Standard Oil, fuel truck sitting there with the hose stretched out over to the train. <laughs> it was running short on fuel. I've never seen that before or since. That, that'd be a rare, pretty rare event. Yeah, yeah I would think yeah. so. Yeah. <laughs>
Can you tell me when the Millbrook Depot went out? Went out? Yeah, they don't. Millbrook or Millington? Millbrook. Millbrook. Mill Brook. They're right next to each other. Yeah. I know where they are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, wow. Not without. Well, I don't. Well, I know it was gone when I went down the Fox River Branch first time in 73. Uh, it's probably been gone a lot longer than that. Uh, I don't really, I can't say. I can remember it, but. Yeah. In fact, now that you mention it, I don't know that I've ever seen a picture of the Millbrook Depot. The Millington Depot is famous yeah. amongst, uh, amongst us railroad historian people because that was the connection with the Illinois Midland. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that gets everyone's attention, that story about the Illinois Midland. And that depot is always in the background. <coughs> They're only about three miles apart. They're only about three miles right. apart. Right, yeah. Down, so. It was small. Go ahead. A lot of people here would know my grandparents. Back in 1929 and 30, my step-grandma, Mae Willie, and most of you knew Mae, was dating my grandpa. Well, she lived in Ottawa. So she would take the train from Ottawa to Burgess Junction, change trains, come to Earlville. Of course, with the time change. I'd like to know if she shacked up the rest of the weekend. <laughs> back down there. So that's how old they dated back then. And Warren was an automobile dealer, so I think it didn't take long. He got a car and he went right to Ottawa. <laughs> Never <laughs> ask her a question you don't want to know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> My mom's here and I'm here. So. <laughs> Never ask a question you don't want to know the answer to. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you.